Hello, everybody. What a beautiful evening. I'm downtown Shreveport. Across the Red River. It's beautiful. Bossier City, Louisiana. Yeah, I'm on the third floor. I still lock my door. Still lock my uh, balcony door. You can't decide. We call that a patio or a balcony. I don't know. It's upstairs. Could be a balcony. But it's not. It's a small space. I like it. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> so, and I'm here with my dinner. It is a um, cold turkey salad over, uh, you know, uh, romaine, uh, chopped romaine. And uh, instead of croutons, I, I used up the last of uh, the muffin <laughs> that I had there, you know, so I put it in the toaster. You know, so I wanted to do a little twist. Plus, I want to use that muffin before it goes bad. And, okay, so, how's everybody been doing? I have been kind of, uh, um, yeah, I was, I was getting over a fall cold. Uh, I'm better now. Yeah. So, um, forgive me, I'll take the occasional little bite here and there, but... I really won't be like eating right in front of you. That there's no preparation to this. It's basically just a, a romaine. Uh, the the dressing is I didn't make it, and yeah, you know, whatever. So uh, yeah. Um, okay, so I want to talk about the fall TV season. I haven't done movie reviews as of late because uh, for a while there just hasn't really been anything out that I've wanted to see um, bad enough to go uh, and see it. I took the opportunity to um, really pinch pennies and, and get things together and do some improvements that I wanted to do. And uh, I'm still determined to get uh, at least this front part of the, the apartment finished, you know, uh, before the new year. Um, and that's basically it's nearly done. Uh, it's nearly done. I just want some shelves for the for the walls, and uh, and then uh, you know some light, you know sheer drapery uh, that'll kind of pull this room together a little bit. You know, and there's some. It's kind of a, a most of it's neutral, and then there's the occasional pop of uh, you know yellow and blue but uh it's it's kind of a a neutral yellow and blue that kind of works with the with the gray that it's propped on so uh even then if there's the occasional hint at a warmth it's uh mostly um yeah it's it's mostly a neutral and then uh, of course, the LED lights and everything. When I turn the lights off and I just let the LED glows and everything, it kind of glows with the with the with the warm uh, but a really soft warm ambiance, you know. Uh, and it's LED and the lights change, so sometimes it'll be like a leaning towards the warm side, and sometimes it'll go back to the soft, blue, and cool side or whatever. So. It's, it's cool. We're, we're sticking with neutrals, but we're playing with it. And uh, that's what I intend to do because the shelves that I want to get for the walls, you know, it's going to, it's basically going to be a lot of um, hand created artwork, you know, either that I create myself or that I uh, buy, you know, and, which is cool. We are right around the corner from the Red River Revel. I've talked about that. Um, Headliner going to be a uh, Jefferson Starship or Starship or Jefferson Airplane. I don't know, whatever. But um, <laughs> no, the lowdown on it when the when the band formed in the sixties, it was um, Jefferson Airplane. Some of the band members left in seventy four. They rebranded as Jefferson Starship, and then in the eighties, they had to come back, and uh, they were just Starship, and then since this new iteration and it's many of the same uh, band members from that time but sans grace slick and uh paul kantner but uh grace slick has signed off on, on the 
you know, she was like, you know, she's cool with it and everything like that. So, and I haven't seen them and I know they've come here in concert and I didn't go and they've been touring. So I hope that, uh, you know, a really good representation uh, is great. See, I think that, uh, for one thing, if, if a band is, is wonderful and they, they, they have a legacy in their music and they want to honor it, even if the, the original members for some reason can't come forward, I don't think there's anything wrong with having someone, uh, you know, who can fill the bill, step in. And for me, that, that example, that was, uh, the band, uh, Foreigner. Yeah. Um, was it Foreigner? Yeah, it was Foreigner. Okay. There were two bands in the eighties that I always got mixed up, Foreigner and Survivor. They had that whole, you know, corporate rock thing, uh, going on and power ballads and all this kind of stuff. So, uh, and Journey, but I knew Journey. Journey sounded different, but Foreigner and Survivor, there was kind of a kind of an assonance almost to those names that I that I used to get uh, crisscrossed in my mind. But yeah, it was Foreigner that that came, and uh, I went with my sister and some friends, and uh, yeah, and the original singer, of course, was not with them, uh, but the guy uh, fronting them did such a credible job. Uh, we wouldn't have known uh, otherwise. It was great. So, um, yeah, um, yeah, I don't mind that. I don't mind that lineups have to change as long as it's an authentic, uh, and organic experience, you know, like it's like, I would much rather someone have a lineup change and an evolution than... Maybe what happened a long time ago, I went with uh, as my grandmother and my mother was still, that was years ago when the casinos first came and they had like a, this crew came and they did like a, you know, pop imitations of, you know, they did uh, the same guy. He came out and he played uh, as Wayne Newton and he came out and he played as Elvis and he came out and he played as uh, Tom Jones and they had a, couple of women and one of them came out and played as Madonna and it was like you know it's great but they're kind of like you know it's insincere and and why not just do the songs as yourself as covers or whatever but it was it's great they were trying to you know they were trying to give the whole you know new this was way back in the 1990s and they were trying to give the uh uh you know Las Vegas show uh, thing going on since then it turns out we don't really care that much for that <laughs> you know we just want to gamble I don't gamble I'm too cheap to gamble but um, yeah I would much I would much rather see a natural progression um, you know and uh, because you know when you go to see a show it, you, you you're gonna not hear the same music that you hear on the radio, even from the same band, the same members and everything, it's not going to sound the same as a studio cut. It's going to sound live. It's going to, and a lot of times it sounds better, more energetic, more real. I've learned that even if it's not like perfect, even if it's not a perfect rendering and sometimes maybe the vocalists, they'll be pitchy and, be, and part, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. The, uh, it's it's the whole that the whole thing and that's why I love live music so I'm gonna go see uh, Jefferson Starship at our art festival check out some art now um, there's something I want to talk about also mainly I haven't even gotten into what I really want to talk about the fall lineup of TV shows ma'am all in one day, basically, because I waited a day or so, uh, and then I got to see them. But uh, I got to see the first um, first two episodes, actually, of Agnes All Along. It is the follow-up to uh, WandaVision, basically. You know, at the end of WandaVision, Wanda had uh, stripped Agnes of her power and uh, basically was able to do, you know... 
uh, yeah, uh, I'll have to go back and watch that very last episode, but I think it had to do with the fact that Agnes trying to zap Wanda or something like that, and she was able to, you know, drain her of her power or something. But, uh, yeah, um, so she had a tra- trapped her in, in Westview and taken away her memory, and uh, I, I don't know how the rest of Westview which was free from uh, one dispel by then. I don't know why they, uh, you know, <sighs> yeah, it was, it was, they hadn't quite gotten into that part. And I guess it wasn't that deep yet. How Westview was able to move past it. I guess they were kind of like, Hey, we don't really say Wanda's name anymore. And I guess maybe they just came into the, uh, the, the realization that what's going to happen is that we're going to keep Wanda, I mean, we're going to keep uh, Agnes, Agatha. She was given the name Ag- Ag- Agnes after she was stripped of her identity and, and made the neighbor. What it basically was, was that um, the the town was going to play along. That was a safe bet, you know. And uh, uh they kind of address that in a kind of a winky, weird sort of way, but in probably the most unrealistic. In 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 a world of Marvel, that even when the most fantastic is played out in a very realistic way, even the time uh, authority and and all this kind of you know all that kind of stuff, it's played out in the most realistic way. In this first episode, uh, you know, of Agatha all along, uh, and Agnes kind of like comes out of her uh, spell and, and, and realizes who she is or whatever, and the neighbor is like, uh, you're naked. And she just walks out in her full identity, and he's like, you're naked. And she's like, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, oh, well, you've kind of been doing the whole, like, uh, you know, crime procedural uh, vibe and we've all just been playing along but it's very non-plausible probably the most non-plausible thing that I've seen uh, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and its tie-ins since Spider-Man No Way Home because you, yeah that's uh, you know but in order to get away with these things, what do you do? You introduce magic, which turns out is a big part of uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. When I was growing up, I kind of went to the Captain Marvels. I kind of went to the uh, Bruce Banner, uh, you know, becoming the Incredible Hulk, that kind of stuff. You know, where science was what was going on behind most of most of everything, and even Thor wasn't a god he was from in in uh, uh, a distant planet and, and and another species of life you know versus being an actual you know god a mystical but but they could have just made him a god for that matter whatever you know it's so weird it's like um yeah and they tried to do that for the first uh, several uh you know phases of marvel and then all of a sudden they went very ultra scientific go figure with the Eternals and they're all robots, <laughs> including the, the great big giant judge of a robot who's going to come back and judge the world. You know, like God. <laughs> and, um, I don't know. Uh, then what's going to happen? I don't know. We get to, we get to, the, the, you know, after that, it's like everything really opens up and becomes not just mystic. It's not just about knowledge. All of a sudden it's really magic. You know, it's not it's not just looking inward and studying and knowing the ways of, uh, you know, the way particles interact. And it's not quantum physics. It's all of a sudden it's magic. So all the science is out the window unless they find a way to come back to uh, that original feel that I loved in the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe that they're slipping away from. So even though I do love this that that first episode oh my god it was so cool it was great and i really kind of you know i like the mystical side if you know anything about me if you've seen me you follow i love um 
I love those things. Hold on, I need a bite. At least I chewed with my mouth open. I have a piece of cheese. And so, <laughs> I'm terrible table manners when I'm home. But when I'm uh, out with people, I don't lean up on the table and everything like that, you know. Um, I like it. Uh, I don't want to spoil it. There's not really too much to spoil. There are only two episodes in. Um, a coven, uh, a, a makeshift coven is gathered. And the whole idea is that they're going to walk down the witch's road. And there's a little bit of a, you know, there's a little bit of a yellow brick road uh, element to this. Like maybe they're kind of, you know, saying there's connections. Uh, even in the titles, they, they kind of uh, give a little nod to uh, Bewitched, you know. So they're kind of, they're kind of homaging, you know, witches throughout popular culture. Uh, good and bad, so it's kind of cool. Um, give it a watch. Uh, Agatha all along, uh, Disney Plus, and um, yeah, I'm gonna give it a great big giant capital S for streaming. I'd, I'd pay a streaming service for it. Uh, and then, <laughs> wow, um, Max. Max, um, the penguin, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, I have to say the Batman, that movie, the Batman, I feel like I like it, but I feel like I've already seen it. I've already, you know what I mean? I feel like if, if Bane were the Riddler or something, you know, Batman, you know, goes through a catharsis as he is battling with his villain and uh, the Riddler. And uh, through this challenge of the Riddler, he learns something about himself and furthers his own personal narrative. That is the same Batman story that gets told every time there's a Batman movie. You know, um, so if it were... If this, if it were, if it was the same story, the only thing they did this time was like, I don't know, make him a, a they tried to make him broodier and like a, a rich Kurt Cobain kind of guy with his little grungy music in the background and whatever. And uh, there's like the more real they try to make Batman the less real he seems to me, you know, at some point you can overdo it, but that's kind of what was happening. And I don't think they're going to tie these movies in together. They're even, they've even got two different, uh, jokers in their movie versus, um, you know, I just, you know, from the Joker wanting to be like a macabre, almost, uh, almost a godfather -y kind of movie. Uh, the, the, where the godfather was uh, the becoming of one character's rise to, to power over the family. Um, that's kind of uh, the same journey that the Joker took uh, with the same tone and the same uh, kind of, wow, you know, uh, climax. And so... Um, this, you know, so we, we're getting this from the Batman, but you know, the, a standout in that movie for me, the whole movie, the standout was the penguin. So it made perfect sense if they were going to do, if they were going to spin off the, uh, that and do the penguin, uh, what a great way to do it. Now this character is tied to the Batman, it does not tie into the upcoming rebranding. It's uh, it's a movie and it's sequel and whatever it's, it's connected to it, they're going to be like Elseworld. It's not really going to be connected to the particular narrative of connected movies, merchandise, video games, and TV show 
it's going to begin in December that um, DC, DC, <laughs> D, DCU, uh, DC Universe. So it used to be a DCEU, now it's a DCU. Or DEU? No, I don't know. DCU. DC Universe. And we're going to start with the Creature Commandos. It's going to be an animated series. And um, that's kind of cool. So in this thing, that we're talking about the Penguin. Now, the Penguin, this takes place almost right after the events of the Batman. If you've seen the Batman, it's also on Max. It's a good movie. It's just, you know, it's the same... It's the same Batman movie, different character, same kind of story. And you know what? Each time they bring a Catwoman uh, into into this this movie with Catwoman, Michelle Pfeiffer was the ultimate just batshit crazy cat shit crazy. Yeah, just crazy uh, character uh, of Selena Kyle. You know, and. Um, of course, there was uh, the Holly Berry version of Catwoman, but that was another Catwoman, you know, different character. But that did kind of tie into how could a cat burglar have, um, you know, such an affinity towards cats in the same way that Batman uh, had this thing with a you know, bats, you know, he, he was traumatized by bats. Well, Catwoman was traumatized by a cat. And apparently, uh, in the Halle Berry version, there was a mystical element like, oh, by the way, you are bestowed. You're like, you, you uh, basically are re reawakened or reborn or re, you know what I mean? Like you were there, this cat brought you back, kept you from dying. And uh, boy, you have really uh, evolved to have like some, cat-like properties whatever they they went a little they went a little uh egyptian mystic with it um i kind of like the way that uh you know michelle pfeiffer's uh selena kyle how the, had they played that out in in the tim burton sequel first well then we got to uh the dark knight rises now I like Anne Hathaway. I mean, she's great. Uh, great actress. I did not like that iteration of Catwoman. I, I just, I don't know. I don't know if it's her. I, I don't think it was her acting. I just don't think they gave her enough to do as Catwoman. What? Well, I mean, she rode around on the on the bat cycle, and she had the thing that you know some minor gadgets, but they really just did not let her shine through as the villain that she should have been. Even if she was going to have a turnabout at the end, Aside from, uh, well, no, really, most of the movie in uh, The Dark Knight Rises, her character was the character who was to stand at the side, watch, and wait for an opportunity. Uh, they also didn't do uh, the Robin character any justice. Uh, spoiler, he was the police officer. Anyway doesn't matter because we're talking about the Batman uh, with uh, Zoe Kravitz playing her version of Catwoman. And I'm sorry, I just don't think that she has it, you know. Um, what I mean by that is that um, there's no chemistry there's no sexual chemistry between 
and I'm sorry, the the whole Batman Catwoman. There has to be sexual chemistry, but I did not feel it between uh, Bruce Wayne and Zoe Kravitz at the end of the movie when she's like, you know, I'm leaving. Come with me. Uh, it's more like come with me on a buddy trip. You know, I did not feel or see that romance between the two of them. I just, the chemistry just wasn't there. So uh, maybe she'll show back up uh, in the next Batman movie. I don't know. Uh, But the standout was uh, uh, the Penguin. And uh, so... Yeah, and this it starts at the end of the you know the end of the end of those events, the penguin and um, Falcone's son or whatever uh, inherits the the such and such, and so the penguin goes to you know deal with them or talk with them or something like that, and they get into it, and and the penguin like just uh, spoiler alert here, but I'm going to spoil it. Um, first episode only though because there's so much stuff happens in this first episode it's like whoa anyway i don't want to spoil it i don't want to spoil any of it but i think the penguin picks up a protege i'll tell you that much the penguin picks up a robin he's not a robin though he's a penguin protege i don't you know uh (laughs) and uh sets off on a course oswald as the penguin that, um, wow, you know, the next few episodes or the next, you know, brief series, I think there's going to be like maybe eight episodes in this. They're going to really get into, um, you know, his narrative as he really rises to be the penguin. Now, the penguin, (laughs) um, the one I want to talk about, uh, the most I'm excited about. Oh, and I, I can't even get into Grotesquerie because that premieres like tonight and I haven't watched it yet. So I'm not going to talk about Ryan Murphy's Grotesquerie, which is uh, in the horror vein, but not quite American Horror Story. Uh, no word on when the next American Horror Story is coming out. We just know that it is probably in early, early 2015. So maybe there's going to be like a delayed... Um, Partially because of the strikes, where they kind of spaced it out. But we are going to get an American Horror Stories over the Halloween uh, uh, four episodes, I think, uh, that are going to be on Hulu. The, maybe you never know about these things. They kind of sometimes they harken back to a previous seasons. Sometimes they give you a little glimpse as to what's coming ahead. Supposedly, anyway. Um. I'd like to think we're going to get a hint. Anyway, and they're probably what they're probably going to do is they're probably going to save the promo for American Horror Story season thirteen, all that kind of stuff until around um, October, you know, because that used to be a very specific holiday for American Horror Story. The very first uh, five or six seasons, what they would do is come Halloween. They, 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 everything was connected anyway, but you'd get a very specific two-part episode, you know, um, leading up to Halloween and then right after Halloween. Uh, you know, you usually play it on a Wednesday, so it'd be the Wednesday before Halloween and the Wednesday after Halloween. You'd get the two-parter. Um, you know, the things would happen in the first episode and then the second episode you'd deal with the fall out the consequences of whatever that Halloween uh, season was. Uh, the first time it had to do with a, uh, ooh, yeah, no, it was, it was, a, it was a two-parter. Yeah, for sure. Cause it was when they found out that uh, Evan's, Evan Peters character. Um, yeah, never mind. But they, but it was kind of like the, 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 the ghost could leave that night and all this kind of stuff. So anyway, whatever. It's cool. It's true. But because that's such an important holiday, that's why I think they're maybe going to start the announcements for season 13 since they're having a delayed season. Probably not intentional. It's probably just because there's such a busy slate as far as Ryan Murphy shows go. 
because we have grotesque the grotesquery that I haven't watched yet, uh, and then the one that I'm about to talk about, uh, which is and you already know probably monsters the Lyle and Eric Menendez story. Now I did not really follow initially when Eric and Lyle Menendez uh, were in the news uh, when all this was going on. Because I'm going to be honest with you, I'm a, I was going through my own business. Uh, I didn't kill anybody, <laughs> but I had I had my own personal issues that I was trying to deal with uh, at the time, and so the last thing I could think about worrying about was what the hell was happening all the way over in California <laughs> when I didn't know how I was going to get out of the the mess that I was in, and I was in a mess. I thought I was. It, it it could have been solved a lot simpler if uh, if I had settled down long enough to get uh, proper guidance. And sometimes, sometimes you fuck up in life. And what you need to do is you need to just take your lumps, man. You know, uh, deal with your consequences. Uh, would have would have would have uh, would have smoothed things over uh, a little bit easier for me if I had just had. A, some common sense. But anyway, I didn't keep up with what was going on with uh, the Menendez family in California and all that because, yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, I'm like, whatever. Um, later on, uh, uh, some of the uh, later appeals and stuff like that, I, I maybe was hearing a little bit about that but there again i was busy a lot you know i i had uh resolved things by the time they were doing their uh second trial or whatever i'm glad for this um um chance to look back though uh there has been a lot of um, online back and forth now uh, and I'll get into the review of the show in a second but I'll talk about it. it's kind of like open to controversy as uh, the claims you know and there have been things that have come forward about the father uh, and, and the mother the, the complicity of the mother and everything that kind of shines some light on the fact that yes there was there was m more more than not there was a uh, some sexual abuse that was a catalyst for the uh, for the rift in that family. Whatever happened and wherever it led, led to, whatever the real reason, the motivation behind these boys, uh, men, young men, uh, killing their parents, uh, that that probably did play a part in it. You know uh, that. You know, you how do you how do you first off how do you trust uh, when you're in fear, and if the father was he that controlling, did it continue on that? Well, I don't know. Whatever, but I will say this. I will say this. Uh, I don't. I don't know to the full extent, but having looked into things, and I, I believe that it's very plausible, and it's not beyond a reasonable doubt that. Um, the sexual abuse did happen. The first, uh, the first trial was a hung jury, and they kind of blocked a lot of evidence from being introduced in the, in the second trial. And they actually took away options. Hey, we're only going to try this as a first degree or second degree. No chance for manslaughter. Uh, we're not even going to accept it. And I, I don't think that the way the second trial went down was fair. In the wake of O.J. Simpson. Now, I don't know uh, if the Menendez brothers uh, were guilty or not. I wasn't privy to all that information. I don't, I don't know. Um, they're still in jail uh, and will be probably for life. It's not likely. Uh, even though new evidence keeps coming forward and they keep getting more support and everything like that, I don't know. Um, but... Uh, I think uh, 
you know, uh, I'm not having I'm not having sympathy for the murder, uh, and even if uh, greed was the motivation, it would not have been the overwhelming uh, decider to hey let's go kill our parents if there had been a healthy relationship between the parents and the children. But there, there was something fucked up about that. You know what I mean? It's not, you, you know, maybe you can get uh, one sociopath. You can't, you're not going to get two of them, you know, or hoping, you know what I mean? So it's, yeah, um, that's, yeah. Let me have a bite. Now, Heavily in play besides the um, the, Menin- the the characters who play the Menendez family, and I have to say, uh, Chloe Savini does great as the mother, but uh, the uh, <laughs> the standout for me in this has to be. Nathan Lane <laughs> as Dominic Dunn. Now, Dominic Dunn is the father of Dominique Dunn, who was the teenage daughter in the original movie Poltergeist. Uh, and before there was a sequel to Poltergeist, uh, Poltergeist 2, uh, which came out a few years later. And what we just recognized was, oh my God, I guess they just wrote off the teen girl. And, and my sister and I, we didn't know. What was going on? Well, she had been murdered. As a matter of fact, she was rehearsing uh, scenes for uh, an upcoming TV miniseries, V. And uh, she was to play the part of uh, um, Robin Maxwell, who was to be the mother of the star child or whatever. That Later on, whatever. So that, that's the way it evolved or whatever. But um, yeah, yeah. Uh, So we get a wonderful Blair Tefkin who did a great performance in V, but going back and looking at the performance of Dominique Dunn in Poltergeist 2, and I, I don't have to do it right now because it's fresh in my mind. I've seen that movie so many times. Mostly, it's easy to let her get washed away in all that happened and all the great performances Um you know, little Carol Ann and, and Robbie and uh, the, the the Freelings, the parents, uh, you know. Uh, and, oh my God, um, Zelda Rubenstein, you know. Uh, you know, scene stealing at the very end of it. Beatrice Strait, uh, Oscar uh, winner, I believe. Nominate, nominated or, or won for supporting actress in Network. But... Um, 1976. See, my mind is full of shit like this. Just, you know, like historical shit no one's really going to care about because it's media and stuff, you know. <laughs> I've been way too much about uh, classical uh, pop culture. Uh, I couldn't tell you, you know, what's on the top 40 today. But, you know, you asked me about uh, some things from a few years ago. I'll tell you what was uh, number one on what day, whatever. But anyway, um, because my mind can connect those dots. One one thread leads to another, you know. But uh, yeah, Dominique Dunn, she died. Uh, and she gave a very brilliant performance. Uh, very memorable. As a matter of fact, she was highly featured in the promo- in the promoting of that movie. The, pr- the promotional scenes, the outtakes they were shown. Mostly it was like her, you know, screaming, you know, what's happening with her little pigtails? Uh, what's happening? What's just freaking out like that right before she gets home and right before the house disappears and the family drives off and all this kind of stuff. So uh, she's very intricate, very intricate to that movie. And then they just, you know, out of respect when they were going to do a sequel, they just didn't address the the teenage daughter. And I guess in my, you know, we just always assumed, okay, I guess she, uh, you know, kind of grew up and got maybe got married and moved away or maybe she's at college or something like that. She's not in this one and she didn't show up in the third one because nobody showed up in the third one. 
except for the daughter and Zelda Rubenstein. Um, you know, family is is so core to everything that um, <laughs> you know their strength and how they keep Caroline and everybody together is to stay together as a family. So what do they do in the third movie? Ship her off to live with an aunt and uncle, Tom Skerritt and uh, Debbie Allen. Oh my God. Anyway, I'm a psychotic psychiatrist. Why are psychiatrists always fucked up in, in movies? Lyle and Menendez. Lyle and Eric Menendez had a fucked up counselor who tried to exploit them. Basically, um, you know, there's an adage that when you go to see a, a psychiatrist, you cannot, he's not supposed to reveal what you talk about in your sessions. But if it's a, there, there are exceptions and admission to murder is probably one of those, especially if uh, there's a chance that you're probably going to kill again. And if someone has killed recently, you don't know that they're not recently going to, you know what I mean? It's, you know, when someone is going to go commit to a murder and they, and they talk about it, 20 years later and there hasn't been anything and then they'll open up to a psychiatrist and say a long time ago I was a, a part of a gang and we did a drive-by and we ended up killing somebody or whatever you know that that kind of confession doesn't make the person less guilty but 20 years after the fact they're probably not going to kill anybody but if it's only been a month or so and you're telling your 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 doctor that you're grieving cuz you killed your parents they don't know that you're not uh, still uh, violent, or that you're, you know what I mean? That you're not, you, and, and, and then this was, by the way, this was the Eric Menendez telling his psychiatrist maybe a month or so after that he was, I'm going to, uh, he was feeling suicidal. If you're feeling suicidal, that means that you are a danger to someone else or to yourself. And so, this psychiatrist failed because he shouldn't have recorded. He should have went straight to the police uh, with what was admitted immediately, right, right on the spot, should have. Absolutely, absolutely should have. And it's a cop-out that he didn't want to talk about it uh, on the premise of, you know, are you going to hurt yourself or hurt somebody else or whatever? That's, you know, this this was a psychiatrist who got into a, a juicy bit and he was going to try to squeeze the Menendez brothers. He was going to try to squeeze them for money. And that was his whole damn play. So, anyway, and then he was a crook, you know, cheating on his wife or whatever with the girl. And uh, I was, I, that was a crazy setup. What the hell is going on in California in 1990s? Um, in a way, I feel better knowing that I'm not the only batshit person that was walking around this country, uh, because, whoa. Okay, so anyway, there's already been back and forth online. Criticism for how Ryan Murphy and and a company have presented this um, monsters the Eric and Lyle uh, Menendez story, but it's the same way they have approached every true crime uh, or true person or whatever, and that is through the lens of dramatic interpretation. And uh, in this case. Uh, it's sensationalism. Everything that Ryan Murphy does is straight up heightened uh, sensationalism as if it comes right out of the internet, you know, just uh, inundated with, you know, and that's, you know, he, that's his bailiwick, so to speak, his, his wheelhouse. And he's good. And he's unapologetically, you know, uh, leans in towards exploitation sometimes and you know something 
people have criticized it. Um, and then after he came back and this, I'm familiar with this work. And after he talked about what he did was he approached this story from different perspectives, from the different sources, because all the different sources surrounding that trial and the family and everything, they all had a different take. And so what he did was when he was focusing on this person and their take and what they thought, he would do a supposed flashback like Dominic Dunn uh, kind of leaned into the idea that, you know, possibly there was, a, you know, uh, some, you know, brotherly incest kind of stuff going on or whatever. Uh, and it's, it's, <sighs> yeah, and it's, you got to remember that these uh, actors were playing these characters from their mid teens going into uh, some of the flashback scenes, you have adult actors playing, uh, you know, teenagers not fully grown into men yet. Uh, so it looks, everything looks a lot more condensed than what it is, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, because uh, this is not a subject matter that you really could bring like children into and responsibly have them play these roles or whatever, you know. I mean, what, what happens in a trial, a big, this was the very first big public courtroom trial. That's what was so important about it. It was before OJ. It was a big thing on court. TV, it coined the phrase gavel to gavel coverage. Uh, I found that out. And so when this is presented to the world as basically it's tabloid sensationalism, uh, talk shows and just jokes and just everything about it, um, that's kind of the way that the people who remember this trial, the ones who were uh, sober enough to remember it. <laughs> um, you know, what was happening was that this monster's version of what's being told kind of echoes that sensationalism. Do you know what I mean? The story is not so much about the uh, Eric and Lyle Menendez story so much as the what was everybody seeing in the tabloids you know it's 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 playing out if if everything had happened in the tabloids the way they exploited it and the way they exploited it in court the most preposterous ridiculous things then um you know it's like such as the da saying boys can't be raped because they don't have uh uh the necessary uh, biology to be raped. That is um, not true. <laughs> or it's we were living in a time where there was a president who didn't think that, um, <laughs> well, he didn't think that uh, oral to genital stimulation constituted uh, sex, so, you know, <laughs> whatever. The world was so stupid. I, me, me included. Except I knew what sex was. But anyway. Um, ah, I still do. Okay, so, <laughs> enough of the silliness. This is, you know, it's just one of those, when you, when you think about it, it, it kind of brings back, I can imagine this whole, like, what the, what is go what in the world you know this story this crazy story um that is what is presented and that is what's given it is just the 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 it's the scandal of it all the whole like tabloidism that's what you get when you watch a ryan murphy 
true crime, be it an American crime story, an American sports story, which I'm going to be tuning in. I'm not, like a, I'm not a big sports person, but that's basically going to be a true crime uh, based on tabloid uh, uh, research, you know, and newspaper clippings and everything like that. They get spun out of control and just the, what media does. The only thing that's Ryan, that Ryan Murphy is doing is dramatizing these and really pointing a finger at how absurd uh, you know, some of that is. Also, you got to understand this is, um, you know, um, this is a thing that is presented that is based on uh, real events. Well, you know what else? What else was based on real events? Um, the Amityville Horror, <laughs> which is. Um, you know, one of the biggest works of fiction that, you know, ever has been. But um, there was a DeFeo family that lived at uh, uh, 113 uh, Ocean Avenue, and they, you know, the, the son did kill the family, and he did go to jail, Ron, Ronald DeFeo. And uh, shortly after that, maybe about a year or so, uh, the Lutz family did move in and stayed for 28 days and got the hell out. And it might just be, I've moved in, that's nothing. I have moved in places and have moved out like, you know, after a week. I've, I've, I'll tell you what, one time I rented an apartment, brought furniture in, set it in. It was, it was discounted furniture, like uh, thrift store kind of furniture, you know, uh, flea market furniture, really. Uh, but had it delivered, had it brought upstairs to the small apartment, paid the paid the rent. Never spent a day in the apartment past moving that furniture in, and never spent a night. Never bothered to turn the furniture on. Um, it was just you know what, me. So I don't know. Uh, I think the reason for it, they said it was spooky and ghostly and everything. I believe in the supernatural. I just, I think that for the most part, when you cross over, die. You become your physical, you become, your physical part becomes part of the food chain and your chemicals, they return to the chemicals. Your solids return to the solids, your fluids return to the fluids, your Gases return to the gases, and uh, if there is a spirit, uh, it either dissolves into um, bits of itself uh, small enough that it doesn't carry memory, or it joins a great big everything and becomes damn near all knowledgeable. And... Uh, Either way, I just, the evidence doesn't show to me that, um, that if there is that spiritual side, and I believe there is, that it's, uh, malevolent. Uh, that's just not, you know, uh, that's just not what I get with it. So I feel like if you come across a ghost and it is a, has a malevolent, uh, way of presenting itself to you, then you're probably not dealing with a human ghost. You're probably dealing with some or, uh, uh, otherworldly demonic kind of bullshit. You need to leave it alone, you know? So, um, yeah. Um, <laughs> Ly yeah, this is my mind, man. Lyle and Eric Menendez. I will say one thing that this is done, because every once in a while this comes back, and I think it kind of you know, should we every once in a while, and I'm not talking about Eric and Lyle Menendez as, as a solid, the people that we have in jail for life, should there not be a review every 20 or 30 years by, by a new generation to fact check based on new evidence? Potentially, uh, often, like, look at the New York Five. They got out of jail 
uh, after being incarcerated for life for a jail that they did not, for a crime that they did not do. Now they weren't totally innocent of other crimes, and that kind of put the, the put the spotlight on them and everything. But they didn't they didn't commit the the the, the, the murders and the crimes that got them in jail, you know. And DNA proved that they didn't. And uh, maybe there's other types of evidence other than forensic evidence that can shine a light on what happened, not just what happened, but why it happened. Because we knew that because because this was, you know, Eric Menendez. If you're if you're, you know, if you if you just if you murder out of cold blood and then you go, you tell somebody. You know, about a month or so later, I mean, you're, you're really, you know, you're not without conscience, you know, and, uh, yeah. So I don't think cold blooded murder for greed was the motivation. I really don't. Um, premeditation. I don't have anybody that I want to kill at all. Nobody, nobody's on my hit list. But I have worked out how to kill some people and get away with it. You know, I'm like, a, I'm, a, I'm a writer. That's what I do. I create stories. I, I make up stories and narratives. You know, I grew up playing games, cops and robbers. You know, I grew up watching uh, nighttime soap operas as a little boy, you know. Uh, and movies and everything like that. I, I know many different ways to kill people. I would never do it, you know, but that's, you know, just having the knowledge on how to kill somebody or whatever, that's not necessarily premeditation. And uh, so the murder in the Eric and... and Lyle Menendez case or whatever. I don't think it started me. I don't think it started with um, the sons pulling the guns on their parents and killing them. Uh, that actual action. I don't think that's where the murder began. I think the murder began Uh, when they started to talk about it, and uh, and it was it didn't take them that long. It's not like they sat around and, and did this for, you know, whatever. Uh, I don't. I, I think that the actual when they started going out and buying the guns, uh, that's when the murder actually began. Do you know what I mean? Uh, like that would that that was yeah so i don't i don't know if there was any premeditation there wasn't very much premeditation to it uh, just to sit around and have an idea like they like the the one son wrote a script about how to kill somebody or something like that a whole year or so ago. just because they've had that thought um and he wrote a script about it, does not mean that he ever intended to act on it. Ever. So I don't necessarily buy the whole premeditation part. I, I don't, you know, I, if I were looking at the case, um, I would have said not first degree, um, I maybe could have accepted a second degree, but mostly I probably would have went more towards like, a, well, I would have went to, I would have went to a, a second degree and there would definitely be um, some consequences and some time in jail and everything like that. I don't know if I could have ruled for the rest of their life uh, being in jail, you know, n knowing the things that I know now, uh, having looked at the case and I'm not saying I'm not saying what they did was excusable at all, um, but we know we know more now 
than we did then. And could they be bullshitting? They, they could be. But we had not seen beyond a shadow of a doubt that they, that uh, we haven't seen beyond a shadow of a doubt uh, that they're not telling the truth from their side of it. Other, uh, you know, uh, when you when you are in trouble, you do you do sometimes lie to get out of it. You try everything until you find the resolve to just finally just admit, hey, there is no way. This is very serious trouble, and there is no way to get out of it. You know, and uh, you 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 exhaust all your options sometimes before you just really admit defeat. Well, these are uh, boys who were raised. Uh, by uh, to be very competitive and to never stop and to never quit and to never give in. So, of course, they're going to stick to their guns all the way through until there's absolutely no other corner that they can back around and they are against the wall. You know, that's the psyche and that's the way that they were raised. Doesn't mean they should be given any uh, break or anything like that. But uh, also, this this second trial coming in right after OJ, they got convicted right after OJ, and uh, uh, Phil Spector got convicted right after OJ. After they let OJ go, uh, that, because they know they fucked up with OJ. Um, <laughs> as for the for there were quite a few. Uh, trials that maybe did not get uh, go in the distance that did not get uh, the the equal balance that it should have uh, so while I don't think uh, Eric and Lyle are innocent I do think they are guilty and they know they're good you know uh, um, I don't know I don't know that, uh, yeah, I don't know, I don't know that, I don't, I don't know that maybe they shouldn't look at, maybe looking at, do they get, um, every once in a while, if you have someone in prison for life and no possibility of parole, there should be a board where every once, where every once in a while that case is going to come across the board and you look at that circumstance and you, you ensure that that ruling is still utterly justified by all the evidence of the time and of the the present uh, of the time when the when the ruling happened and in the present today would it still hold up i really think that's the case because there are people in jail who are in jail for uh possession of marijuana and that's basically legal everywhere today for the most part so you know if we're going to give that treatment to minor crimes, we need to give it to, all the way across, you know. Um, anyway, for an entertainment for an entertainment view, you're you're going to enjoy um, if you like true cr uh, true crime kind of stuff and a little sensationalism and and a little bit of a oh my god what you know, and uh, the murder scenes are graphic, you know. It's it's Ryan Murphy. You know, creator of American Horror Story, Nip Tuck, whatever. So you're going to get graphic imagery. Um, I enjoyed it. Okay, so let me do my rating for The Penguin. If The Penguin were in the movie theater, uh, I would pay a uh, standard price to see it in a movie theater. That's how good I think The Penguin was. Um, and, uh, and I already rated Agatha all along as a streaming capital S for streaming. And I, uh, I'm going to give monsters. I'm going to give monsters, the Eric and Lyle Menendez story or the Lyle and Eric, Menendez, whichever one, I don't know. Um, I think Lyle's the older one. Eric's the younger one. Um, you know, <laughs> Some of the stuff I I, I don't want to I don't want to spoil it, but some of the things are just non plausible. Like, you know, yeah. 
<sighs> anyway. It's... It's dramatized. When you go into looking at this, monsters, know that it's dramatized, but also enjoy it for the story that it really is. I know that people are criticizing it and saying blah, 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 and this and that and everything, um, but also they're liking it because uh, they're watching the hell out of it. So what happens is because of this show, people are talking about it, and then there's a documentary that's coming up next month. Uh where uh, Eric and Lyle are actually going to be interviewed for the first time in a very long time uh, together, I think. Uh, and they're both going to speak. I, I know that Lyle has spoken uh, in, a, in a couple of uh, documents. Uh, there's one called um, Menendez or something or, or whatever. There have been a few different TV movies about it. There have been uh, fictionalized stories uh, pulled and based on this, there's been a mini series on TV uh, for Law and Order of the Menendez. It was kind of like I don't know. I didn't watch it because I mean, you know the time, but I didn't have an interest. But because I'm a Ryan Murphy fan, what Ryan Murphy did give a little uh, service that he's given some attention, wider attention to this issue, and maybe more people are going to look at. You know, do they need to look at this or not? Now, I'm not defending murderers as far as murder. I'm just saying that uh, the big one of the big uh, reasons in the retrial after after the hung jury and the mistrial, <coughs> excuse me, after the mistrial was declared, they did not allow the issue of abuse to be brought up as a motive. <coughs> the entire trial was to determine the type of crime. Was it murder one? Was it a second degree murder? Was it manslaughter in some degree? And they cut off the explanation. They did not, they did not allow uh, the explanation given to be, to be presented in the second trial. Uh, so, that's not a fair trial. I'm not saying that um, the law should shelter criminals, but a person is not found to be a criminal until they're found to be a criminal, and in that case, they should be able to speak and defend themselves. Um, I don't know. I think... That um, the way the way that this show presents itself is that Lyle, as the older, domineering kind of brother, has has more of a you know almost an exploitive nature of his own uh, that maybe he's gonna you know he thinks he's gonna get out. And he's going to, you know, at this, so he's, up to say, you know, he's really certain uh, that they're going to be okay and that they're going to be able to get out of jail. And so he's already been collaborating on a book, but the book he's been collaborating on uh, through jail and through this, you know, it's, it's uh, basically, you know, she decided to publish not just the things that they talked about, being in the book, but all the rest of the content of their conversation and, and uh, everything. And that kind of sunk them a little bit. I don't know. Um, I, did, I didn't, I like I said, I wasn't following any of that way back then. So there, there's a lot of stuff that's been sensationalized. Um, is this, um, is this um, just, um, you know, that they were trying to look at, well, we're going to have to try to do something positive with this, uh, try to, uh, whatever. I don't know. I, I don't know. I think some of the cocky remarks that they're attributed probably was a downplay because it made it made it seem like, hey, there's not a remorse. Well, sometimes when you're in 
flight or fight, if you cannot run and you're in a fight, what you do is you say anything, you 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 puff up your chest and you say the most ignoramious, you know, BS that you'll possibly say and you keep a brave face and it's all a big huge self defense psychological uh issue and that could have been a lot of what was going on with Lyle Menendez. You know, so I don't know. I just I, I think that it bears being looked at. If they look at it again and come to the same conclusion, eh, I'll be satisfied. I mean, I'm satisfied one way or the other, but it's just that I don't, you know, whatever. <sighs> but I think the moral of the story is don't kill your parents. You know? Uh, don't. Uh Yeah, no, no, don't do that. Instead, maim them, cripple them, uh, leave them so that they can't walk and talk, so they can't rat you out. You can get your revenge that way. You still get to inherit the money, and uh, blah, 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 and then, yeah, whatever. I'm just kidding. Don't do anything to your parents. They're, they're fine. Yeah, honor that father and that mother. Peace, love, and light. God bless. Good night.